The following presentation occurred during the 2022 South Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, MHTTC, first episode Psychosis, FEP, conference. This conference occurred from June 1st to June 3rd, 2022, in a hybrid format, with approximately 150 in-person participants in Austin, Texas, and 300 virtual participants from around the world. Conference attendees shared a range of identities and positionalities, including those with lived experience, family members, providers, and researchers. The 2022 theme of innovation and sustainability highlighted not only the radical advancement within early psychosis programs over the past decade, but also the continued transformation that we hope to see of mental health structures and research serving youth and young adults living with psychosis. This conference was an opportunity to engage in shared dialogue across difference, struggle with new ideas, and re-envision a future for mental health structures for youth and young adults living with psychosis. This conference was coordinated and hosted by the South Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, MHTTC, in Region 6, an initiative funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration to provide free training and ongoing consultation to all professionals that serve individuals with mental health needs. Region 6 includes the states of Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arkansas, Louisiana, and our tribal communities. The South Southwest MHTTC is a project of the Texas Institute for Excellence in Mental Health, which is housed at the Steve Hicks School of Social Work at the University of Texas at Austin. By way of a disclaimer, this conference was prepared for the MHTTC network under a cooperative agreement from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, also known as SAMHSA. The opinions expressed throughout the conference are the views of our speakers and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services, or SAMHSA. The following video is a recorded talk on suicide assessment and prevention by Dr. Tara Neendam. The presentation includes discussion and examples of suicidal thoughts, behaviors, and death by suicide. She's the executive director of the UC Davis Early Psychosis Programs and has developed four early psychosis programs in Northern California based on the coordinated specialty care model of early psychosis. Her research focuses on improving clinical and functional outcomes for youth with serious mental illness with a focus on mobile health technology. She's the principal investigator for the Early Psychosis Intervention Network of California, or EpiCal which is part of the NIMH EpiNet program, which we also have in Texas. EpiCal links multiple county and university-based early psychosis programs to bring client-level data to the clinician's fingertips and enable large-scale data-driven approaches to improve outcomes for early psychosis care. She also directs the EpiCal Affiliated Training and Technical Assistance Center, which seeks to bring evidence-based early psychosis care to all Californians. Within early psychosis and uh, research context, Dr. Neendam has worked to amplify the need for high quality suicide risk assessment and management protocols, as this is really crit critical to doing our best work. And so we're so excited to have her here today to share with us her knowledge and experience. So welcome, if you don't mind, Dr. Neendam. Thank you so much, Molly. Um, I'm assuming everyone can hear me. I feel very loud right now. Okay, great. Um, wonderful to be here. I had the chance to get to know some of the EpiNet Texas folks um, yesterday. Um, really just pleased to be here and talk with you all about something that for me um, is an important research area and an important clinical area, but I also have lost folks to suicide. And so it's, it's a personal thing for me as well. Let's see, it's not going, there it went. Okay, so just some disclosures. I own a company, it has nothing to do with what I'm talking about today. Um, and these are all of my funding sources. So as we're talking today, I hope you walk away with three key things. 
Um, I want you to understand the difference between proactive suicide risk management and reactive suicide risk management. Um, I know many of you are already familiar with the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale or the CSSRS. However, I've trained many people and then find out they still don't feel comfortable with it. So I'm going to go through it today and we're going to practice together with the hope that afterwards you feel like you know it a bit better than you did before. Um, and then I hope that you're able to walk away as well with being able to understand at least five risk and five protective factors when we're talking about individuals who have suicide ideation and behavior. So before we begin, um, and I really want to appreciate the students with psychosis yesterday, they talked a lot about language. Language is powerful and it's powerful in this context too. So um, I want everyone to just keep in mind that um, people on this webinar in this room have lived experience. They may know people who've died by suicide. Um, they may have experienced their own suicide thoughts or behaviors um, or know someone who has. So I want everyone to feel comfortable having an honest conversation today. But if you're gonna ask a question or you're gonna put a question in the chat, I want you to just pause for a second and think about the language that you're using. The other piece, um, is thinking about how we talk about suicide in clinical contexts and community contexts. Um, I really want to discourage folks from saying committed suicide or killed themselves. Uh, it really speaks to criminality and a criminal view, um, a moral view of suicide ideation and behavior. And it's really blaming and stigmatizing. So um, I want to encourage all of us to say died by suicide or a suicide death, just like we would talk about cancer. We don't say they cancered. They, you know, we, we really wanna talk about it um, in a way that doesn't blame the individual. Okay. So proactive versus reactive suicide risk management. Have any of you heard of this concept before? Ooh, some of you, I'm excited. I have to say when I was trained, I heard none of this. It was just the person comes in, they talk about suicide and you respond, which is reactive suicide risk management. So one of the key things I wanna talk about today is how we can engage someone in talking about their suicidal thoughts and behaviors at the beginning of care in a way that is normal and comforting. <laughs> and then we can develop a plan for how the individual and their support persons can manage these thoughts when they come up. Because they, they come up when we're in distress. These are some of the thoughts that we have. So we want to have people have the skills and the tools to manage them effectively. And so we're going to use assessment tools like the CSSRS. I'm going to introduce you to two more in case you want to have something to self-report in your clinic. And then I'm going to talk about safety planning. And I know you guys have also been trained in safety planning. Um, but I'm going to talk about it today, not just as like a piece of paper that you have to fill out to make sure you've covered your risk management protocol. I'm going to talk about it as part of your assessment and your intervention. Okay. And then at the very end, we'll come back to reactive risk management. When you have someone who's in crisis sitting in front of you, what do you do? So why should we care about suicide as mental health practitioners? When we think about suicide, um, this is how the, the folks that we're working with die. And usually in a healthcare set, setting, this idea of mortality is what drives the intervention choices. You wanna minimize mortality. So for us as mental health care providers, this is how folks die, which makes it super scary for us, right? Um, in 2017, 1.4 million adults attempted suicide. And it's really important for us to keep in mind that we have to care about attempts because oftentimes folks are seriously injured as a result and may have permanent damage or disability. So this is important. Attempts are very important. Over a quarter of individuals will make a second attempt 
in the time following their first attempt with the greatest risk in the first two years. Okay, so it, it is very common for folks to continue to consider this as a way of managing how they're feeling. When we think about serious mental illness, like psychosis, it's associated with an elevated risk of suicide. That's why I'm here, right? So the folks that we are serving have an increased risk of suicide and a very high rate of death by suicide. And it's the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. And we know with the mental health crisis we're having right now, that it's happening more often, particularly um, in youth. Um, in 2017, there were 47,000 deaths from suicide. That's one death every 11 minutes. That's a lot. Um, it's the second leading cause of death for young people. And these are premature and preventable deaths. So I'm sitting here as a clinician right now, and I'm feeling the weight of this, right? I'm like, oh, and I've had folks in my clinic die by suicide. I've had multiple folks attempt suicide. Um, so I've had to deal with the aftermath and my staff and our clients who knew the people in group, the families who knew the family because they've been in group together. This is something that for us, especially those of us who are licensed is a big deal, right? And so I want us to acknowledge the, the feelings that come with carrying this responsibility. And I also want to acknowledge how that makes us avoidant, <laughs> how it makes us be like, I kind of don't want to have to hospitalize you, take away your rights because I'm worried about you. Um, I don't want to have to break our trust and tell your parents so I'm just gonna kind of walk away from that. I feel like the same sort of feelings come up when we talk about abuse reporting. And so I think it's just really important for us to sit in that discomfort and be like, this is hard, but I also care about you. And so I need to be able to protect you. Um, and oftentimes in supervision, I talk a lot with my, my staff about this challenge that we face in, in keeping folks safe. So within schizophrenia, and I wanna be really clear that that's a very specific diagnosis, right? Psychosis is a much broader um, continuum. Between a quarter and a half of folks will attempt suicide. And again, serious damage, even from an attempt. Um, most folks make repeated attempts, 5% die. Um, it's most likely in the first year of illness, but risk is ongoing throughout the course of illness. So for those of us who do first episode psychosis work, and we're trying to catch people as early as possible, right, to mitigate the impact of their illness, it also means that we are wanting to make sure they have the coping skills to manage to stay alive especially in that first year. Um, so as we are doing this work, we have to pair not just early identification and treatment for psychosis, but early identification and treatment for self-harm and suicide. Okay. So you're sitting here, and, and I'm sure all of you have had some training in suicide risk assessment management, right? And you're probably like, yeah, I've learned about this, but I still kind of don't know what to do. I don't know which factors to look for um, because there's so many, it's a moving target. How do I handle this? There's no like blood test or brain scan for it. It'd make, make our lives so much easier. It's really individual. It's really individual for that person that you're working with. So I'm gonna talk about biological, psychological, familial, environmental, cultural risk factors, and tell you that you're responsible for assessing all of them. So we're gonna go over these. It's also really important to keep in mind that these risk factors that we're gonna talk about don't always predict behavior. 
folks have these thoughts all the time. So it doesn't mean that they are going to attempt. And I find this, I've done a lot of um, training in schools and had to really work with folks to think about just because a kid says they're thinking about this doesn't mean they need to go to the hospital. Um, how do we understand where someone is along this continuum of risk so we can make the right choices about the level of support to provide? And that's where I think the um, CSSRS is really helpful because it helps you to sort of understand the levels where a person is at and then how to titrate your intervention because just having suicidal thoughts doesn't equal hospitalization. Okay. The other very important piece, and I, again, have seen this, my own clinicians struggle with this after someone dies by suicide. Folks tend not to tell you before they make an attempt. We have this belief that they'll come in and disclose something, and in that moment, we will swoop in and intervene. Sorry, folks, that's not the case. They do it impulsively, which is why many folks are left with this, what if, why didn't I, I could have. And so again, this is why if we acknowledge that suicide is often an impulsive act, the idea of proactive risk management is even more important because our window of opportunity is in the escalation towards that thought, not when the thought is there. Okay, so Hopefully today you'll walk away with a better sense of how to catch people as they're ramping up and provide them with the supports that they need to stay out of the hospital or some other restrictive environment and stay in their home with their loved ones, going to school, going to work. Okay, so key points. I wish I could give you one risk factor. I can't. It's gonna be based on a multitude and it's gonna be very individual. You're gonna to need to put together the risk factors and the protective factors to get a sense of how that person is doing. The other really important point here is that the things I'm gonna talk about, many of them are modifiable. They can be part of your treatment plan, like social isolation. That's probably something you're managing anyway as part of your treatment plan. It's important to acknowledge that having social contacts is a protective factor for suicide risk. We're going to talk about, again, in that sort of ramp up to where the thoughts are might drive behavior, you're, we're going to talk about these sort of distal or chronic risk factors, the more proximal risk factors, and then the warning signs that say, hello, I'm in distress. Um, and we're going to talk about how this should guide your treatment decisions. Risk assessment isn't a single event. Doing it once a year is not enough. It changes over time. Just like psychosis, just like depression, just like substance use, it changes over time. And so you have to be able to fluidly assess risk. Um, and I also wanna make sure, like I'm gonna tell you about all these risk factors and tools and whatever. I always want you to listen to your gut because sometimes you know that person better. And you're saying, I know they're saying no. They're saying no, but there's something, and you can't in that moment put your finger on it. Later, you'll be able to. Please, please don't stop listening to your gut. Trust that too. Make that part of your assessment because it's valuable information, again, that you might not be able to articulate in the moment. Okay. So let's talk about different kinds of risk factors. So let's go way back, way back in terms of distal background things that just in general at a population level put folks at higher risk for suicide. Um, so these are lifetime general characteristics. So some of them are demographic, like being male. It means you're more likely to die by suicide. Um, having a history of aggression and impulsivity, just having a tendency to react impulsively, to react aggressively, having difficulty with problem solving and cognitive flexibility. So someone who tends to get stuck on, you know, one solution and having trouble considering other solutions, 
you can see then how if suicide comes into their mind, they might get stuck and have difficulty considering other choices. Um, so one of the associated parts of this is head injury. Um, genetics, we can go all the way to serotonin functioning. Um, Pre-morbid social adjustment. So as I mentioned before, social connection is a protective factor. So if it's always been hard for you to make friends, to have social connections, to have good relationships, that puts you at higher risk. Many of us know that family history of suicide is also a risk factor. Prior suicide attempts, trauma, loss, there's a number of them. Okay, so that was back in the history. This is something we would gather, right, as part of our intake evaluation. Now we'll come a little bit more proximal to a potential attempt. These are more recent events or changes for the person that puts them at higher risk for going in the direction of suicide. So an acute psychiatric episode, having a recurrence of intense depression, a recurrence of psychosis, of really severe anxiety, any sort of increase in psychiatric symptoms um, can lead to a suicide attempt. Similarly, an acute medical illness. So folks having, I can give you an example from my clinic. We had um, one young woman who was struggling with diabetes and she had an acute diabetic episode and it took her to having suicidal thoughts because she was like, I can't manage all of this, right? So it might not be psychiatric. It could just be medical. A stressful life event, a breakup, a divorce, a fight, losing your housing, all of those things are incredibly stressful. And it's understanding, understandable how it could lead someone to think about taking their own life. Um, poor social support, family conflict. Um, and this is something in our work, we're always trying to work on family relationships, communication, problem solving. In doing that, we are reducing someone's risk for suicide. Acute substance use. If you're having a hard time, use some substances to cope, might make decisions you might not make otherwise, it lowers our threshold, makes problem solving harder. And then access to means. So I'm gonna take a second, get on a soapbox and say, please talk to your clients and families about securing weapons in the home. Um, you know, many places offer gun locks. You know, if folks have multiple guns, considering buying a, like a safe, you can keep weapons safely in your home, but a lot of folks don't. So having easy access to means is a very high risk indicator for suicide. So one of the things we do at screening for folks coming into our clinic is asking if there's weapons in the home and asking if they're secured. We just ask it of everybody and work with people to secure them. Um, we've actually, we have lock boxes in our clinic that we will give families, we'll loan to families that they can put weapons in. And then we encourage them to lock them in the trunk of their car and sleep with their keys. If their young person is having, you know, in a crisis, it helps to keep them safe in the home. Okay, warning signs. So we're like, now let's say we've got somebody who's got a history of depression and now they broke up with their girlfriend and they're feeling very upset and now we're escalating. Things aren't going well at school. Ah, we're going up. Um, what are the things for that person that signal that, that, that they're at higher risk? And so this is why knowing this history is so important. What are the things that came before that have led them to start having these thoughts or considering these behaviors? And are you seeing those things now? Um, and so you really are thinking about for this individual, what are the warning signs and what is my time frame? So for some folks, it can be hours. You can look at their previous attempts or the times they've had this and you're like, Ooh, this goes from zero to 60 in a couple of hours. And that's gonna motivate your intervention in a different way than someone where it's like, it took them two weeks to build up before something happened. You need to know that timeline, okay? And so you'll be looking at things like talking about it more 
or um, using more substances, isolating more, getting in more fights. What are those things for that person that really say, I'm in distress and I'm just, I'm not able, my coping skills aren't working. I'm, I'm just not, not able to manage. And so there's lots of things for folks. And it really is very individual. There is no one thing. So here's some examples of behavior, things folks say, moods that you may see. Okay. So now let's start talking about a few other differences that we want to keep in mind. So again, more males and females die by suicide, but females with psychosis are at higher risk for an attempt than other groups or the general population. They will make more attempts. Males just tend to be more successful. Um, sexual minority youth have a higher risk than non-minority youth. They're facing lots of challenges. So they will often have difficulty managing the distress that comes up and so we may need extra support. Certain occupations are associated with higher risk. Veterans in the military, construction, arts, entertainment, food. In, in Sacramento, there's a um, big movement in the food industry to address suicide in restaurants. We had a huge rash of suicide, um, suicides in our, um, in our community. And so the food industry banded together to address it. Sports and media. Oftentimes, many of these um, occupations, you don't talk about your troubles. You deal with your troubles on your own. And there's not a lot of support for mental health. Um, and often they're very high stress and very physically demanding. When we break things down by race and ethnicity, um, we can see that there's increasing rates for everybody. And if I were to put up to 2022, it would be even more striking. So this is for adults and we can see that um, between 1999 and 2017, we saw a big jump in um, rates of suicide attempts. And then this is in, you know, not, I can't now see, like I can't talk. Non-Hispanic, <laughs> um, white, black, API, um, American, Indian, Alaska, Native, and then this is his, folks who identify as Hispanic, okay? Um, I want to highlight the biggest jumps in individuals who identify as white Caucasian, and then um, the epidemic of suicide we have in our Native American um, indigenous population. This is like a crisis that is happening right now that we need to address. That's for females. For males, we see a very similar pattern. Huge rates of attempts for both white Caucasian men and Alaska Native Indigenous. But rates are going up everywhere. So it's not, don't just focus on those two groups, pay attention to everybody. Okay, unemployment or lack of regular meaningful activities is associated with higher risk. That's a primary concern for the folks we work with. Individuals who aren't in a romantic relationship um, they're single, tend to die by suicide more often. And really this relates to that social functioning piece. When we focus on psychosis, individuals are at higher risk when they are bothered by their symptoms, they're distressing, they're uncomfortable, or they are compelling them to act. One of the most common uh, things I hear is the voices or the thoughts, the delusions, right? are saying, I need to die to protect my family. So they are gonna do something bad to my family. And so we see the youth act on, on their experiences. Um, so as we are rating ideation, we will rate those thoughts or um, those experiences as ideation on the CSSRS. And then if we have folks go to the hospital, particularly for suicide, the risk is highest in that three to six months post-hospitalization. And lots of us get folks from the hospital. So always keeping in mind that's a high risk time. 
All right, I've alluded already to many of our protective factors, having access to mental health treatment, having a positive attitude towards mental health treatment. Some of our folks don't have a positive attitude toward the work we're doing. So we need to acknowledge that's a problem. It increases their risk. Feeling connected with other people, having effective problem solving skills, an accepting and supportive environment. And that's not just accepting and supportive of psychosis, it's accepting and supportive of you as a whole person or that individual as a whole person. Having reasons for living and then limited access to lethal means. So I'm gonna talk about the CSSRS, but I wanna be super clear, it's only one part of what you need to do. So I really like the safety in my clinic. I usually print this out front and back and put it up on all the desks. Right now in the land of COVID, we don't all sit at our desks anymore. So I encourage you to print it out and hang it above your six monitors in your home office. Um, because when this stuff happens, you need to be ready, right? You need to be ready to go. And when our adrenaline kicks in, we're apt to forget things. So as a supervisor, as a clinician, whatever you may be, you need to be ready to respond. So this has a couple of different components. So identifying risk factors. I would argue you do this at intake. You know the distal risk factors. If they have had recent ideation or behavior, you know the proximal risk factors. So you are going to know what those risk factors are ahead of time. Then you're going to identify protective factors. These are the things you want to boost. You want to support if they've got friends or family or a sports team or a dog or whatever it is. You want to make sure those things are engaged. Then you're going to do your suicide inquiry, and that is the CSSRS. You're going to ask about right now thoughts and behaviors, history of thoughts and behaviors. That's one piece. Then you're going to determine the level of intervention this person needs right now and what they might need in the future. And then you're going to document it because you're thorough. And you want to make sure if you go on vacation, the person who's covering for you knows what to do if your client is in crisis. So it can't live in your head. It has to live in the chart. Okay, here's the backside. And again, this is a, oh my gosh, they're reporting stuff. Ah, what am I gonna do? Here it is, it's written out for you. <laughs> Rip it off the wall, take a look. Um, so it lists out the risk factors I've just talked about, the protective factors, the inquiry if you can't find your CSSRS. And then right down here at the bottom, it gives you a beautiful little table that you can use to figure out what to do. Okay, so very simple, very easy. All right. So now let's focus in on how we assess suicide risk. The problem with suicide risk assessment is that all of us use different words to talk about it. When I say hallucinations, we all know what that means, right? But when I say suicide attempt, there is a lack of clarity about what that means. Um, people call it all different sorts of stuff. And I'm sure you guys have seen this in charting or heard it in team meeting, calling things a threat or a suicidal gesture, um, you know, passive suicidal ideation. If I asked people to start defining it, y'all would totally give different answers, which is why passive suicidal ideation is not allowed in my clinic because no one knows what it means. Um, so one of the things I think is really important, again, coming back to language, is that when we use these vague terms, oftentimes they're pejorative and they're incorrect. So one of the things I love about the CSSRS super clear on its language, super clear on its definitions. Everybody knows what everybody is talking about. So the reason why they developed it was to address the lack of clarity in language because it was impacting not just treatment, but research. People were calling all sorts of things suicide attempts. 
in research? And then how do we study it? How do we understand the impact of medication or of a treatment on risk? We can't if we aren't labeling things the same way. So the CSSRS is the gold standard for young people in assessing suicide risk. Um, it is not designed to assess risk factors, protective factors, supports, or to tell you how to respond. That is why I gave you the safety. That encompasses more. The CSSRS is one piece. Information, use it all. Any information you get from anybody who's willing to tell it to you, please don't break confidentiality. But you know, if mom is saying one thing, but cousin is saying something else, and then you're hearing something else from the individual, that's all information, right? Whatever gets you the most clinically meaningful response. Oftentimes folks think that the client is the most appropriate person to ask, and yes, you should certainly ask them, but sometimes they don't remember what happened. They don't remember what was going on before that, or they're super embarrassed and they just don't wanna talk about it. Okay, well, what can we get from the record? What does mom remember? Um, what can we do to try to understand better what happened in that moment where suicide was a choice they were considering? Okay, we're gonna look at the components of the CSSRS. Now for me, I have divided it into different time frames. So you guys might look at the copies you have and be like, hmm, this doesn't look like the CSSRS I've seen before. Um, and um, that's because I changed it because I wanted to be able to assess lifetime and past month. My staff were saying, there's no space to write and I can't keep things straight. And I was like, well, I can fix that. So I just made more space. It's the same content. There's just more space and boxes. It's a little easier to write. Um, so you'll see in there that it talks about lifetime, which is ever, have you ever thought about? And then there's past month because it's really that past month when you're thinking about highest risk. And sometimes when I've got um, a client who this is an ongoing issue and we're really trying to keep them safe at home, you can change that past month to past week. You can change it to yesterday. You can do whatever you want for that time frame. Um, but you just really wanna make sure you've gotten that history of what's happened before whatever your current time frame is. You wanna get the details. You don't want the average of their uh, suicide ideation or behavior. You really wanna get the times when things were the worst um, because that's gonna tell you where they're gonna go when things are bad again. Behavior is lifetime, you capture it all. Total lifetime of events. Okay, so when we started ideation, it starts at the top, wish to die. It starts there for a reason, because lots of people have thought of that. Lots of people have thought about going to sleep and not waking up. So it starts the conversation in a way that's normalizing. And that's how you guys should ask it because lots of people think about it. Um, so that's wish to die. And oftentimes this is what people call passive suicidal ideation. In my clinic, it is wish to die. They endorse wish to die. We can put it in quotes if you'd like, that's fine. Then you go to the next one, which is, have you actually had thoughts? And I wanna note, it does say in here, killing yourself. I have argued with Barbara Stanley about her use of language. She has told me that she doesn't want to change it because there's too many copies in circulation. I was like, that's not a good enough reason. Whatever. <laughs> so um, we agreed to disagree. Um, so you are uh, in my in my clinic. We certainly changed that language. Have you had thoughts of wanting to hurt yourself or end your life? Um, and if you guys would like to have, because I think I sent you PDFs, if you want the word version, I can send it to you and y'all can change the language however you want. Um, Barbara agreed that it's fine. Um, if they say no to these two questions and on the sheets that you have, there's a big thing that says, if no, go to behavior. You don't have to keep going, okay? Because what I see <laughs> happens in my clinic is they ask the first two and then they just stop. And I'm like, no, 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 folks, we gotta ask about behavior too. So it reminds you to please go on to behavior. But if you get a yes, you get you have to keep going. Okay. On the form you see, 
your little prompt. If yes, continue. If not, go to behavior. I remember what it's like to be a tired clinician. All right, then you move on to associated thoughts with methods. Have you been thinking about how you might do this? And then you get to intent. Have you had these thoughts and some intention of acting on them? And then plan an intent. Have you started to work out how you might do it? Have you intended to carry out this plan? And again, I wanna remind all of us who work in psychosis that the content of delusions or hallucinations counts as thoughts, so we rate it here. So here are the next sections. Again, you can see I have lifetime past month. And then as a supervisor, I make people check. So like you might ask this question and the answer is no. You need to check no, because otherwise I think you haven't done it. And then when the auditors come in, we haven't been thorough. So once you do that, then you're going to go to an intensity of ideation um, and ask a few follow-up questions, frequency, duration, controllability, deterrence, reasons for the ideation. The reason these are there, and so you think about that items one through five on the front page, that is increasing in severity. And then you're going to take the most severe lifetime and the most severe past month, and you're going to ask these follow-up questions. Okay, so it's one, two, three, four, five. So on the page, it's like, what's the level? It's one, two, three, four, five. Five, and then here's the intensity of those experiences. So when I am doing supervision or I'm training my staff, this is how I use this for decision-making. When all I have is ideation, when thoughts are more frequent, they last longer, they're harder to control, they have fewer deterrents and stopping the pain is the reason that's when I start to become more worried as a supervisor. I'm starting to think about how we're gonna to intervene to keep this person safe. Okay. Now this is where I tend to get in discussions with people. Suicide behavior. So we're gonna be really clear today on what a suicide attempt is. Again, we're gonna be very thoughtful about our language. So a suicide attempt is a self injurious act committed with at least some intent to die as a result of that act. You do not have to actually get injured, just the potential. Um, any non zero intent to die counts. People have mixed feelings. They're ambivalent in that moment. So you don't have to be 100%, yeah, I'm all in. I had one client where I was like asking her these questions and she was like, well, I didn't, I didn't wanna die. And I was like, did any part of you, any part of you hope or wanna die in that moment? She was like, 0.07%. And I was like, that's non-zero. So when I say any non-zero intent, it counts. Because we want to take this seriously. We want to take that seriously. Because we know what happens when we don't take these things seriously. Folks escalate. And that we don't want that to happen. The intent to die and the behavior need to be linked. And this is where we don't consider non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. Because when folks engage in non-suicidal self-injurious behavior, they aren't in, they're not trying to die, they're trying to cope. So that's where we break that link, okay? And then sometimes intent can be inferred. So um, if they thought the act could be lethal, they might deny intent, but the, when I jumped off the bridge, I thought I could die, that you count, okay? I thought if I took 200 pills, I might die, then you infer intent. Okay, an attempt begins with the first act, the first pill, the first cut, it starts there. If they stop, 
It's still an attempt. And why is this important? <laughs> because it shows you how far someone's ready to go. They're ready to cut, they're ready to take the pill. They don't have to take 200 pills, they don't have to cut that deep for us to consider it an attempt. So to determine if someone's made an actual attempt, um, you would ask them this. Have you done anything to harm yourself? Have you done anything dangerous where you could have died? And usually I get a lot of skateboarding answers to that. Not quite the same. Um, <laughs> we're, that's not quite what we're looking for. Um, and then, you know, there's some extra questions there that help us really dive in. Uh, and I'll show it to you in a second. So again, let's separate this out from non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. Um, I call this non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. It's a lot of words. You are welcome to abbreviate it as NSSID. I don't like to call it self-mutilation. Um, again, very pejorative, right, in the language. Let's, let's use the, the term appropriately. Um, people do this usually to cope. Um, it brings about endorphins. You feel better gives you a chance to take care of something when you might not really be able to take care of yourself. So um, it can be used to manage internal states. It can also be used to manage external states, to get attention, to get sympathy, um, but it has a function. Even if during that moment, a small part of them wishes to die, it's an attempt. So oftentimes these things go together. And so you have to ask about both. really important to ask the whys. Why did you jump off the bridge versus, you know, assuming that it was to die? Maybe they thought they could fly. Maybe it wasn't a suicide attempt at all, right? So we don't want to make assumptions. Just ask. Um, oftentimes I find that folks have had multiple events or they've had multiple events and non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. I like to use numbers to keep them straight or dates to keep them straight. Um, again, I put space on the page, but sometimes it's not enough. Um, you wanna know all of them. So just making sure again, you're asking about intent when you're asking about both of these. So here's what the page looks like. Um, has all the lovely questions. It reminds you of the definition of suicide attempt at the top, just to ground you to what we're talking about. Um, I put in there, have you ever, have you in the past month, again, change it to past week, if that's what you need. Um, the, I starred and bolded the top three because they're really the key, but I love the ones that are at the bottom because sometimes you really have to ask some more questions to use those. There's, I highlighted this one. Did you think it was possible you could die from? That might help you infer intent. And then down here is our non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. And you're gonna code that separately from suicide attempts. At this point during the presentation, Dr. Tara Needham led an in-person exercise. This exercise included specific descriptions of suicide attempts. If you are interested in participating in this exercise, please contact the South Southwest MHTTC. So now we're, we've gone through, we've, we're all clear on what an attempt is. It's an act, the intent of dying as a result of that act, okay. So when you're going through the behavior section, you're gonna, there's different types, there's different choices of, of things, right? Um, we wanna make sure we only pick discrete behaviors because there's preparatory behavior down there. We only wanna rate that if that's all that happened in that event, because sometimes people prepare and then they make an attempt. We're just gonna rate the attempt. Um, you're gonna have every separate event. And again, numbers, dates, I encourage you to use those because sometimes you need them and it gets difficult. I can't control the screen. Let's see if it works now. Okay, so you'll go through and you'll rate the different types. Oops, go back. Um, there's, did we go too far? I like technology and it's hard. Okay, let's go back, go back. Yes, we missed this slide. Three types of behavior. Actual attempt, 
okay? And we have an interrupted attempt. So they're taking the steps to do something, but someone, something, or they, that's an aborted attempt, stops. So an interrupted attempt, like maybe they're putting the pills together, but the dog comes in, the dog is something that they wanna live for, they care about the dog, they pet their dog, they put the pills away, right? That is an interrupted attempt. Yes, dogs count as interrupters. Then there's an aborted attempt where the person themselves is taking steps, but they stop themselves. Okay. Um, so they have not started to act. So maybe they have the knife, but they haven't cut. They have the pills, they haven't taken any. So that's the difference here. And then preparatory behavior. All right. Now we're, whew. okay. We already said this stuff. Lethality readings. This is on the second page. So if you've had an actual attempt, this is gonna look at how lethal it possibly could have been. So you're not gonna rate this section for any ideation, interrupted, aborted attempts or preparatory behavior. I'm only gonna rate this, rate this if somebody had an actual attempt. So what actually happened, how serious was it, or how potentially serious was it? So you can imagine, right, you have someone who's going to use a handgun and they put it under, you know, and they pull the trigger, it doesn't go off. So in that moment, it wasn't lethal, but if it had gone off, it would have been serious and the person likely would have died. So this is giving you a sense as a clinician of when they go this direction, where do they go and how likely is it to be lethal versus they take pills, get their stomach pumped, end up in the hospital. Not trying to diminish the impact of pills, I'm just saying. You know, we wanna make sure that we are really taking that into consideration. I work with kids and sometimes they don't understand lethality. So for example, I've had folks report trying to drown themselves in the bathtub, trying to smother themselves with a pillow. They are doing an act with an intent to die. They're seven. They don't understand that that isn't how things tend to work. So we want to make sure that we're still counting that as an attempt, even though the lethality is really low. I've seen lots of people dismiss early attempts by kids who are trying to end their life. Okay. Actual attempts only. I've put a note up there to remind you. Here's where we rate. The codes are right here. So I sort of said this, let, lets you know how bad things can go. Reminder, you're always gonna ask about ideation and behavior separately. Just because they don't have ideation, they could have behavior. Lots of folks act impulsively. So here's an example. Clinician, have you wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up? Client, mm, no. Have you actually had any thoughts of killing yourself? Mm, no. Okay, but have you tried to harm yourself in order to end your life because you wanted to die? Well, once I impulsively tried to hang myself because I wanted to end it all without even thinking about it. So those two things are often dissociated. Now, at this point, folks go, all right, so you want me to do the CSSRS? There's a lot of questions here. I'm pretty busy. Are there any things that we can give folks before they walk into my office to let me know if I'm going to need to spend 30 minutes doing a CSSRS? And I go, yes, there are. Um, so there's two different um, questionnaires that you can consider using. Um, this is the suicide behavior questionnaire. I like to pick things that are for younger people because the language is simpler. Um, so I use it with adults too. Um, folks just tend to know what it's asking. So this one's very simple, four questions, and you could use as a brief screener. There's also the ASQ, which is often used in ERs and in primary care. Also very simple. You could consider using that as well. Okay. So now at this point, oftentimes I get a question of like, can peers do this? Could a case manager do this? And my answer is yes. Yes, they can. 
If you've had training, like what we just went through, yes, you can use this measure. It's designed to be used by anybody. Now, I do think there is a question of whether peers should be doing this. That's different. Um, it, Cause then the, the management piece comes up and that's a lot to ask of peers, particularly if peers have lived experience with suicide. So keep that in mind. So anyone who's done this training can do it. Doesn't have to be a mental health professional. Um, oftentimes people also have thoughts of like, if I ask about suicide, will that make them suicidal? No, no, please. People have these thoughts anyway. You know, not asking just means you don't know and you're putting yourself and your team at risk and the person. A second in-person exercise occurred at this time. Again, please contact the South Southwest MHTTC if you would like more information. So when we're thinking about intervention, this is something that I've, I've worked with folks at On Track New York with, and I wanna give credit to Yael Holoshitz for working with me on this. It's this idea that we really need to be proactive in our management of risk. And so um, if there's no acute risk, if you're not sitting there making a decision about hospitalization right now, you are doing proactive suicide risk management. And we're gonna talk about safety planning, which I know you guys are familiar with. Then there's the reactive. This person's in crisis right now. Hospital is the place, the only place that is going to keep them safe. And I really wanna stress the only place that's gonna keep them safe. Um, I feel like sometimes we go too quickly for our own concerns and not about what's best for the client or the family. Okay. So the individuals at acute risk, if you're seeing increased ideation intent and behaviors, increased psychosis, unable to engage in safety skills, there's a lack of support to help the person stay safe in the community, and they're not willing to engage in treatment. Okay, and so every clinic has a different hospitalization protocol. Make sure you know yours. I really want to encourage all of you to in incorporate this into your regular work. So at my clinic, we do it at baseline and every six months at minimum. For folks who have active risk, we do it more often than that. So we really are trying, just like you might check in regularly with your clients about their psychotic symptoms, their depression, their anxiety, you should be checking in with them about their ideation and behavior. So um, really seeing this as, as part of what we need to do and including safety planning as part of what we do as well. Um, I'm not gonna go over safety planning because you guys are familiar with it. But for me, if I'm assessing somebody and I'm like, they're at risk, I need to do a safety plan. That is an engaging part of your treatment. You are learning. What are the things that trigger these thoughts? What are the things they can do to cope? Who are the people they can call? What places are safe? What places are not safe? This is part of our work and you do it collaboratively. The idea here is that people, when they're in distress, aren't great at being like, well, let's consider my options for how I can cope with this situation. They're like, I'm in distress, right? And so the safety plan is like a really simple guide for how to manage that distress. So how can you help them think about the things that they can do or that others can do to help them feel better? Now, don't be surprised if at the beginning of treatment, they don't know. They don't know the things that set them off. They don't know what to do to feel better. They don't know who can help them. That's informative. As a clinician, you're like, wow, this person's feeling really bad. And they, they don't have a lot of skills. They don't have a lot of support. All right. Let's get to work because those are going to be the pieces you want to fill in. The other thing is it changes over time. They may put their mom as a safe person and then later mom ain't so safe anymore and they want to switch it out for their aunt. That's cool. It's their safety plan. Put those things down there. You want them to be able to use it when they need it. So oftentimes in our program, we have the client take a picture of it in their phone. So it's there. We also, um, if their family or the people that they live with, maybe their roommates or their partner, put it on the fridge so that when somebody's really upset, you could go and be like, okay, you know, do we, do we want to, uh, how about a walk? Did you want to try a walk? You can point. Nope. Nope. Okay. Not a walk, uh, movie. Do you want to do the movie? Nope. Okay. And then sometimes there's a crisis. They come up with a new coping skill. And then they come in next week and they're like, whoa. 
that didn't work at all. <laughs> can, we, can we switch these out? It's part of your treatment, part of your treatment. Please, please, please don't think about it as just a risk management tool. Use it actively. It is a living, breathing document. Lots of other evidence-based risk management strategies, means restriction. Um, problem solving and coping skills. Um, one of our, our folks on the, the Students with Psychosis panel brought up DBT. Lots of great skills in that DBT workbook for managing risk and big, big feelings. Pull out a DBT book, use that. Enhancing social support. And then doing some motivational interviewing to figure out what other things the person is interested in adding to their toolkit to help them manage when those big feelings or those really upsetting moments come up. There's also specialized therapies. And I have to say, as an early psychosis program, we have seen a rapid increase in suicide, ideation and behavior over the course of the pandemic. Folks just aren't doing well. And we've been looking, we've already integrated DBT. We already do DBT skills, um, super helpful. We're also looking at the CAMS, which is kind of like the safety plan, but a little bit more in depth about managing suicide risk. So if you, in, in your program, I know as we were talking yesterday, some other programs are seeing this increase in distress and intensity, consider some of these options. It really gives your staff more tools to manage. Just keeping in mind that the idea of the safety plan is like stop, drop, and roll. You just practice it over and over and over and over again so that for folks when these feelings come up are more likely to engage their coping skills. And it always is a collaboration between the clinician and the individual. This is our version, might be different than your version. Um, we start again with um, triggers and stressors. What, what happens on the outside that makes you think about this as an option? Um, what are the thoughts, feelings, and other warning signs? What are some internal coping strategies? What are people and places that provide distraction? And then people you can ask for help. And then professionals you can contact. One of the most helpful things we did was adding the suicide text line. Lots of our youth use that as a way to manage in the moment. Ways to make the environment safe. That often leads to a very important conversation about what's available in the home to keep things safe. And then what are the things worth living for? We use it all the time. Almost every intake gets a suicide um, uh, safety plan. Um, and then we always update it when we need to. Lots of other things that you can use. I think oftentimes, again, we think of the hospital as the safe place when we can create a lot of safety in the home. So at the back of my slides, all sorts of links to all sorts of business that you guys can take a look at, safety planning intervention, numbers, references. All right, I have five minutes for questions. It's a button. Yes. Um, thank you so much. This was super educational for me. I'm in a peer role and I've not had um, this training at all. Uh, so I'm just sort of curious uh, what you see is because there are peer support specialists on the FEP teams mm -hmm. in a lot of places, like what our role can be um, just in, I guess, support for people who are feeling suicidal or at any step phase along the way? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So first of all, really glad peers are here because y'all need to know this stuff too, because sometimes people will tell you and not tell us, right? So you need to have this information just as much as we do um, so that then you can come to the team and say, hey, this client said this, this sounds like ideation with intent and plan. How should we intervene? Um, you know, I think how you intervene is important. I often in, in California see peers put in clinician-like roles. And that, 
that's not where y'all should be, right? You're, you shouldn't be hospitalizing anybody. Um, that's, we get that privilege. Um, you know, you are there to amplify the voice of the individual. The family partner is there to amplify the voice of the family. So when we're um, doing a safety plan and we feel like peers are important to call in, it's because we want support and understanding what the individual wants and what the individual finds helpful. And then sometimes for the family partner, it's like, how do we help them stay calm or see this as important or engage? So that is where I think peers can be really helpful, um, especially if you have lived experience with any of these things. So I was very lucky. One of my former peers, she had um, experience with, with suicide ideation and behavior and repeated hospitalizations. So she was able to, to um, sometimes in those conversations, vocalize the fear of being hospitalized as a reason for not talking about suicide ideation, right? And so she would be able to sit in the room with the client and be like, you know, I know when this happened to me, I was really scared that I was going to go to the hospital. I'm wondering, clinician, if there are other alternatives we could consider besides hospitalization. And then the, we would be like, well, yes. You know, um, so I think that's where I see peers as invaluable in these conversations. Um, and to the family peer side, when your loved one is wanting to die, like that's just like my heart sinks as a parent. I'm like, oh, you know, you, and, and, and all you want to do is fix it. And you want to, so sometimes you're like, ah. or other times there's so much distress going on at home, you can't engage. And so sometimes the family partner can be so great at helping us understand how best to engage that family member. And maybe that person isn't in the space right now to be that point person. Like I've had parents like tap out. Just be like, I can't, I can't be the primary person. Okay, great. Who can't, oh, can we call in the aunt? Can we call in your aunt, right? So it's your all's role is to, to guide us so that we're listening to what folks need. So we develop the best plan for everybody. Yeah? Okay. Great question. I, I wanna thank you so much, Dr. Needham. Can we have a big, thank you. Thank you for joining us for the recording of this presentation from the 2022 South Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, MHTTC, First Episode Psychosis, FEP Conference. To learn more about this conference or the work of the South Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, please see our website, accessible by the QR code on screen. You may also join our newsletter or follow us on Twitter or Facebook with the QR codes on screen now.